You know, what, what is it that we will have to sacrifice? What is it that we will have to put on a back burner? What do we have to stop pursuing to actually get into the core of who we are, right? We are an evaluation of the world. The world will write books about us and put statues, you know, and give us accolades or talk about us on podcasts and songs and things of that nature. Once we actually reveal ourselves on a certain truth, right? Once we actually come outside of the realm of normalcy, then all of a sudden we increase in the world. But to be a normal person, like an unsung hero, right? You can save a thousand people, but no one knows because it wasn't such and such that saved these people. And no one knows this person that saved these people, right? So now it's like your existence becomes insignificant. Wow, check that out. If nobody knows your truth and nobody's able to take your truth and put your truth on a plateau to create it in a statue like Buddha and things of that nature, right? Are you a truth in life? Do you really exist? Are, are, are you essential? Is, is this really just a mirage like you're just having like a daydream that you're actually here? in real time, in real purpose. So if I got to pinch myself, I'm going to go, ouch, right? And this goes to show one fundamental factor. The truth of you is the truth of you. It doesn't matter who believes in your truth, who sees your truth, who doesn't see your truth. If they were to write books about you or rub statues or give you accolades or pat you on the back or tell you how magnificent that you may be, right? These things really, at the end of the day, really don't matter. What matters is that you have to be able to put yourself under the microscope, like really put yourself literally under a microscope and analyze yourself. Take a deep breath. And then lock yourself in according to your truth. Right? And know that your truth belongs to you, right? Know that, know that, you know, nobody's able to take it, to alter it, to even have you know, an awareness of it, if you do not share these certain things, if you do not go around boasting and bragging, if you're not egotistical about who you are and what you are and what you have become, no one, most people will never even know that you even exist. If I didn't go sometimes even do these podcasts, people would not be in my inbox asking me about this, asking me about that, or questioning this thing, or, you know, cursing me out over here, or things of that nature. Right, these things I would not be exposed to because I didn't come out and step into my truth. My truth is I'm a motivational speaker. One of my truths, you know, I like to interact with other people. I put myself in very peculiar situations to advocate and fight for the lives of other people. These are some of my truths. This is why I actually created um, the data, right, as a truth, right? But if I didn't do this, who would know about Nathaniel Evans? Who? Yeah, my friends, my family, my immediate circle. They would say, we know him. We know, we, we grew up with him. You know, we used to play in the sandbox together, right? But do they really know my truth? They may know me. I may have conversations with them. We played in the sandbox, you know. You know, we used to sleep together in the bunk beds when we was young and things of that nature. But do they actually know my truth? How many people know you for who you're supposed to be? Like how many people will actually that you can actually say without a shadow of a doubt that knows exactly who you are and know exactly what your truth is? Who can stand up for you and say without a shadow of a doubt, I know that person's spirit. I know what that person is capable of doing. I know what that person won't do, will do. And I'll tell you this, man. It could be a thousand years from now, and that person would still be the same person. Would we be able to actually make that assessment for other men and for other women that's, that's in our lives? 
do we know our coworkers? Do we know our boss? Right? Do we know um, what's going to happen in the future? Do we know what's going to happen in the past? Right? Do we know what's going to happen in, let's say, 10 minutes? Besides me sitting on this podcast, do you know what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes? You probably don't. We're living in a life where we're so encumbered upon certain realities. We're so locked in according to enormities in a world, as I would say all the time, that was created before I came here, right? We fall, we fall into cultures, into belief systems, into moralistic views, right? We call ourselves liberals and conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, right? And all these different terminologies. And a lot of these terminologies actually exist before we was even alive, before we even opened our eyes. These things is already here. So now if we jump into these things, you know, into this ball and pot with everybody else, and even though we may exert ourselves, even though we may be recognized for being this or that person, is that actually our truth? Would that truth survive for 10,000 years and we were to live consciously for 10,000 years would that truth that we have today, would it continue to exist? Would it continue to assess us, to increase us, to validate us, to hold us accountable, right? Would it show us that we are a solid entity, that there is no fluctuation in who we are, and that we're just this robotic system, right, that never alters to the right or to the left. Would your belief systems, would your truths right here, right now, survive within you for 10,000 years if you was alive? And maybe say, oh, that's far-fetched. Okay. Well, some people believe that we never die, right? Some people believe that we are spiritual entities having a physical experience. Some people believe that when we transition from here, we're going to transition to a greater place, right? We're going to be connected to a higher being that created us. And this higher being is actually going to endure us with gifts and rich foods and drinks and things of that nature. And is it true? It's someone's truth out there. Somebody right now can say, I agree with Nathaniel. I believe that we'll never die. And if that's the case, then that means that you will be alive 10,000 years from now, right? If the truth that you have right now, would it be your truth in that time period? Would you be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that who you are today will not change in 2024? 2025, 2026, and thereafter, right? We have wars that's actually taking place all over the world, some micro, some macro, right? Some of these wars shaped us individually, but some of these wars are actually shaping us and can, will continue to shape us on a collective level. So you may say that, you know, I'm a humble, peaceful person until somebody makes a comment, right? I was reading an article the other day, uh, a young man was in LIU college, he had a prominent position. The young man said something about the Israel-Gaza war, I don't know what side he was on, but he had said something derogatory about the war. In fight. But was he standing in his truth? Did he actually believe that what he was saying was the truth? And did he actually believe before he stated that other people was actually going to agree with the truth that he actually put out there, he may have thought that this was the case, but it turned out that this was not the case. That other people that heard him speak this truth, which was his truth, were offended by what he said. They were so offended that his statement went all the way to upper faculty. And as a result, he got let go from his prominent position. But that, you know, but but this was his truth though. No, no one could in the world would say that this was not his truth. Now I want to read another passage from my book that I have picked out today, which is William Grant Still. Okay. 
I don't think that it's good for the world of music to have everything out of the same mold. God didn't place only roses on earth or only lilies or only violets. He put flowers of many sorts and many colors here. The beauty of each enhancing that of the other. How about that? Check that out, right? So you'll say, you know, roses are the best. And then somebody else says, lilies are the best. And the other person says, violets are the best. And then someone says, no, there are other flowers out there that are great in all those flowers put together, right? This, these are the individual sound truths, right? That they have tapped into, right? And they can't be dissuaded to say, no, you were incorrect. There's another reality, another concept that you have missed. There's another flower out there that you have not taken note to. And as a result, you, know, you did a disservice. How about this other passage right here? This is another one. Um, Lucille, Lucille Bogan. I got a sweet black angel. I like the way he spread his wings. This is a quote, right? Just like that. There's nothing else, right? And this was a profound quote. And that person, Tom, and that person, period. But this quote has actually reached up into the 21st century. And what do they mean? I got a sweet black angel. I like the way he spread his wings. Are they talking about a black man, right? You know, are they talking about a real black angel, right? We don't know, right, what this concept may be to everybody because everyone is different, right? Everyone views life and sees life in a different way, right? And not everyone is going to look at this passage and say, wow, you know, this is a sweet black angel. Is it talking about a man? Yes, because it said his wings at the, at the end of it, right? So it was a male entity, right, that they're talking about. But who would say that a Black person is a sweet Black angel, right? Who would say that a Black person is valued on, on that type of light right there, on that type of level, right? We're looking in the world, we have different optical lenses, right, that we're seeing the world from. And a lot of times these optical lenses are subjective to the individual, right? This is William Herbert Browser that made this quote right here. This quote was done in 1897 through 1987. The last one was for Lucille Bogan was 1897 through 1948. This is how long these people survived. So in 1897 from 1987, William Herbert Browser said this quote right here, walk and never get tired, fly and never falter. I'm gonna move on up a little higher, move on up a little higher. Surely God is able. Hey, look at that, look at that, right? So this is a belief, this is the truth that regardless of what happens, I'm gonna keep moving forward, right? I'm gonna keep striving for greatness and keep striving for greatness and keep striving for greatness. And surely the most I is able to help me on this journey, right? This is a space where I'm like, okay, even if I'm not strong enough within my own will, right? There's an entity that's out there that is strong enough, wise enough, and maybe even accountable to assist me on this journey, to assist me on this path, right? I'm learning. As I go, when you're looking at different leaderships and you're looking at different concepts, and I'm learning that, you know, I'm I'm alive in 20, 2021, but there were other people that were alive in different eras, right? And it's not and it's not just me, right? Some of these shoes that other men and women have actually put out there, right? I wasn't here for those things, right? At the waters, right? She was born in 1896 into 1977. And I was five years old, basically four or five years old when she passed away, right? And she says this, only those who are being burned know what fire is like. His eyes is on a spiral, 1951. 
right? Check that out. I'm gonna actually put that one in the comments because it really is something totally different, right? So it says, this is Ethel Waters, right? Ethel Waters, right? He was born in, this concept came out in 1951, right? And it says, only those, only those that, that are burned by fire, let me show you know, know what fire is like, right? This is exact, the exact quote, I didn't change anything, right? right. So, let me, let me hide it. Let me, let me edit this. All right, so I kind of like, where you get it. only those that are burned by fire know what fire is like, right? So I'm missing space here, but I'm trying to type. But it shows this was a concept in 1951 by Ethel Waters that actually talks about being burned by fire, right? And how many people can say without a shadow of a doubt that they know what it feels like to be burned by fire if they've never been burned by fire, right? This is the truth right here. Some people may say, no, but I, I, I can I can somehow experience, I can imagine, right, what it will feel like to be burned by fire. But if you never truly was actually burned by fire, would you actually know what fire looks like? Would you notice? I don't think so. This is the truth within itself. This is not a truth that you know, someone is speculating, it's not opinionated. Right, it's something that is a value system that someone is able to determine, and maybe they got burned by fire, and they may try to explain certain things to you, but they cannot. Right, as we journey through this life, we go through different challenges and different truths that a lot of times others will not understand what those truths are. We can go all out our way to get them to understand what these truths are. Right, and they would never know it. How about this one? This is Queen Mother Atley Moore, eighteen ninety eight to nineteen ninety seven. It's past due. The United States will never be able to pay us all they owe us. They don't have the money, but they owe it. Right. So, right, so this is this is the truth, right? That that was in this time with this woman, right? And this is all in 1898 that this concept was actually vibrating in the world, right? But then you have people would say that, well, the United States don't owe nobody anything, right? There is no such thing as reparation. You know, people went through what they went through. We don't owe nobody nothing. And then you say other people would say, well, you know, that's subjective because they, they help other people who actually went through similarities that other nations went through. So why is one race of people more important than another race of people? And now we get into a whole mirage, right, of right and wrongs. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's telling the truth? Who's telling a lie, right? And now it's this merry-go-round, constantly, constantly, constantly fighting to get your position, constantly trying to say that I'm valued I have purpose, I have meaning, and you know, I'm you know, waiting for someone to acknowledge that I have value, I have purpose, I have meaning. You know, people look at you strange as you move into your life, and people will try to challenge you and say that you're not what you say you are, and, and things of that nature. And it's like, okay, so if I'm not who I say I am, when does my truth have value? And who, who am I going to tell my truth to that's going to believe it without a shadow of a doubt? 
who's going to respect me and honor me in the land according to 